So like I said in the last video, this is going to be a fairly quick intro just because the project in the video is no longer my shop, it's already installed. So to make it pretty short, um, this is the second part of that, that series. And this I'm mostly gonna detail making the inner panel framework because there is some detailing on it. And I do make a mistake, unfortunately. When I'm rushing on stuff this time of year, I'm really busy. This is one of the only open spots left in my shop. And I'm not complaining, I love having having the work. But whenever I'm rushing is when I, when I do make mistakes. So I'll put the mistake in the video because it was so, something that hopefully other people can avoid with this sort of design. But um, another thing I wanted to mention, and someone brought this up in the comments, and I'm happy that he did because I meant to mention it in the video and I just forgot to. But whenever I use um, construction grade lumber for, for wood pro projects, um, if you have a hardware dealer that you go to, I don't own a moisture meter. Um, really good ones are, are very, very expensive. So I've just never gotten one. And I buy my lumbers from people I trust to, to sell me something that has a, an accurate reading of moisture for my climate. So that is, that is key. I wouldn't go about it blindly. But um, with that said, that lumber, um, is usually the number that gets thrown around a lot is 9%. People get really finicky with it, but 9% is one you'll usually see uh, if you do read about moisture in lumber. Now, when you're using a construction grade lumber from like Home Depot, for instance, that lumber is not dried. Even if it says it's kiln dried, that just means they're drying it faster than letting it air dry. They kiln dry it from anywhere from like 14 to 19% is, is usually the number I'll see. So that means it can still move and shrink on you, whereas your hardwood lumber is already hopefully at equilibrium for your area. So that is also a geographical number. Um, if you live in a part of the country and these do exist or a part of the world where you um, experience humidity all year round, that your equilibrium, equilibrium number is gonna be a little different. If you live in a very dry climate, it will be a little different. So. Um, if you're interested in pursuing learning more about those numbers, I would recommend researching based on on your climate. But um, so with that with that said, with that lumber, I like to buy ahead of time to not only acclimate it to my shop because I have no sort of heating or cooling system out here. In the winter time, I do have a propane heater, but I don't run it all the time. So. Um, I like to acclimate it and also let it sit for a little bit so that, that it loses a little bit more of that moisture. Does it get down to the 9% I'm talking about? I like to think it gets pretty close. Um, once you start getting into the low teens, it's not going to shift a ton on you. You're not going to see it move an inch or whatever, but it will st still move. And um, luckily I use that, that lumber in a lot of projects over the years. I've never had a customer call me up to say something moved or cracked. But if you want to use that, and I prefer using it because that quality of lumber from Home Depot is actually pretty decent. And it, um, it saves the customer a ton of money, especially on these painted projects. There's really no point in, in using hardwood on something that's going to be painted. Um, so that, but I wanted to throw that out there as something to consider because I did not mention it in the last video that using that stuff off the rack, it could lead to problems down the line depending on what you're making. But I mean, I've made butcher block tops and all sorts of stuff out of that lumber and I, I haven't had an issue with it moving too much. Um, but like I said, with pre-buying it and letting it sit for a little bit before actually using it. So in fact, I have another project coming up which I'll probably film which is recreating some cornices for one of the houses in town. And it's the same thing, it's gonna be painted. So I recommended that lumber. And that project isn't due until the end of December, but I'm probably gonna buy that lumber at least in the next week or so, let it sit in my shop so that come December, um, I'm more comfortable about using it. So the interior part of these panels is gonna be made out of three quarter inch birch veneer ply. This is a cabinet grade lumber, and I'm just roughly cutting it down to size. The basic size of this is um, the inside of the panel plus, and I believe it, I uh, made that dado groove about an inch, so plus two inches on either side. I've definitely cut these panels too small before because I haven't calculated that inner groove before. 
So if you're doing something like this, just make to double check you're, you're adding the, the depth of that data groove onto your measurements and doubling it, um, not making it singular. As you can see, this is one of the main reasons, one of the many reasons I love a radial alarm stall is I could cut pretty long panels on there. These are over 30 inches wide and they only had to uh, hand saw a little bit that the, the saw couldn't go through. So then I'm marking center on my two panels. I cut them down to final size on the radial alarm saw and I'm drawing a center line down the whole thing because this is going to get um, a mountain pattern or a chevron pattern really, however one of you, you want to describe it. Uh, basically arrows going up and down. You're just kind of played around with the measurements on it and the angles on it to get that first um, that first angle correct and like I said I'm working off of a picture so I, I just kind of looked at the picture and eyed up what it should look like. I believe I ended up going two inches up off the sides and then 16 inches up the middle and that gave me my first triangle. Yeah, you can see I'm marking it 16 and then two and the, the triangles go off the panel in both directions so there will be triangles below that one. So I'm going to be cutting these with a router um, they don't have to go all the way through, they're just enough of a groove in order to give you the detail. So I'm making a jig off of that original measurement because that's the one I liked. So I'm just going to cut this down and then mop. I'll put a bushing in my router and the router can follow this pattern and I can cut all of those triangles identically. Um, the main problem you're going to have with flush panels like this, because you'll see it's going to sit flush, if you glued up your door unsquarely, you will have gaps in this panel. It's unavoidable. I had some hairline gaps I was able to fill with caulk, but if you want to do a design like this and you want the panel f flush in the front instead of just floating um, in the center, then make sure that your panel's glued up squarely. Um, you can, I kind of cut these edges off square because you'll see how I cut the, the dado grooves, uh, the rabbiting grooves on these later, but that would be just a huge pain. So I added a straight edge on the back of this and then I'm going to add some um, cleats on both sides just to make sure that this can't really move side to side going up and down the panels. I want it all to register pretty much the same way. So you can see it slides up and down the sides and I could just kind of mark how high I want my triangles and then just cheat it up the whole panel. You can see I think these are about four inches apart. Four or three inches apart was the spacing. I'm just going to pencil draw the whole thing all the way up so that I could follow that pencil mark when I take um, when I start using the router. This actually looks like a ton of extra work. It really wasn't that bad. I thought it was going to to really suck to be perfectly honest but it wasn't that much extra work. So this is um, the bushing set I'm using. It's actually the same inlay kit I used for it to make the circles in the, the last table I did. And I'm going to be taking the bushing off of it. There's two kind of two settings on this. And then with that eighth inch bit, I could get really close to the plywood. So I don't have to spend a lot of time calculating the offset of that bushing. To hold everything in place for the time being, I'm using um, a, a chunky block of metal. This thing easily weighs probably 30 pounds and in order to start on the bottom of the panel you could see I actually have the cleats on the panel that's going to go above it um, just to hold the jig in place and then this is clamped to my table and I'm making my first cuts. So on this I went off a little bit towards the top you could see it there that was actually the only um, one I messed up on and it ended up not mattering because I end up recutting this panel that I'm cutting right now. See, I could just line everything up, put the weight on there, and then um, in two passes, I, I cut the groove. I'm only going down about a little over an eighth of an inch, I would say, max. So you can see I'm just riding, very simple work, just riding that, that jig coming to the end. So the next cut you'll see, I run into a problem with the jig, which was easily fixed. And that is because um, originally I was only cutting these short triangles and it wasn't a problem. But as I start moving this up the edge, I have to cut off the sides of the panel and the jig just wasn't, uh, I was hitting that back fence. So I just added a spacer with some screwed pieces in there and that's how I fixed that. So you can see the spacer butts that fence back far enough that now I can clear it. You can see if that fence was where it was originally, that right now the router would be, would be hitting it. 
So that was a pretty easy fix. And this is the final jig. I ended up using this for the whole piece and to, to recut the mistaken panel. So there I am, just like I said, two passes, cut the whole thing. And then I can just keep moving up. So that's what it's looking like. So this is where the mistake comes into place. I did not notice it at this point. It was when I went to go put the panels in place, I had an oh no moment, and then it was proven to be an oh no moment. And that is because you could see I'm continuing the panel the way it is. I don't account for the thickness of the lumber in the middle of the door, which made all of my angles um, inaccurate. So but you'll, you'll see later exactly what I mean by that. But before you could see, I was just continuing the pattern up. I was cutting the second panel the exact same way. Um, this panel was a, a hair skinnier than the other. So you could see I'm using a shim on one side just, just to get the whole thing cut. And towards the top, you're just, it's, this was, like I said, very simple work, which ended up being a godsend because I had to remake an entire panel. And um, if it was difficult, remaking it would have, would have not been fun at all. And that weight is awesome. I got it from an older woodworker who was like, ah, oh, you can never have enough weights like this in your shop. And I didn't have one. And he was right. I use that thing all the time. So then once this is done, I'm going to cut, there's a groove down all the pieces. So you want to make sure your triangles are all perfect with that intersecting line. Cause if they're not, then your the center line going will not cut through the peaks of all of those, those um, triangles. It will look terrible. So this is just a simple thickness of a table saw blade going down the panel. And then this is the cut I made. This is the practice cut to make sure the cut I put on the panels will fit in there. And this is just taking enough material out to fit in that groove, but then also be flush with the top. So once I had that perfect, I had the whole thing set up. These are just rabbit cuts. Like I said, it's an inch, so I'm gonna have to make two passes. I think I cut about a little over half inch each time. This is just the entire edge of the panel. I'm adding a rabbit and then it could slide into that groove. So you could see at this point what I was talking about with um, if your panel, if your door is not square, these panels aren't square. When you go to slide them in the door, you'll have gaps between this rabbit groove and the edge of the panel. Now this was painted. So if there were huge gaps, gaps, truthfully, I would have just caulked them or filled them and, and went along with my business. But if it was going to be stained or, or clear coated, um, you would see those gaps. So the first pass was to cut the edge. And then this is with it um, cutting, cutting the other side of it. So it gets to be about an inch. I just moved the fence over a little bit and um, I got that inch, inch rabbit. You can see what there it is, the inch rabbit around the whole, whole perimeter. So right about here was when I kind of came to the realization that that middle partition was going to be a problem, but I was hoping that I was wrong, even though it was one of those circumstances I knew I wasn't going to be, but I fit the panels in place anyway. They fit in there perfectly. You could see there's, this isn't glued together, which is uh, the glued together. The, none of the doors glued together yet, which is why there's a little bit of gap. But then you could see with the second panel in place, you can see that those lines just don't line up. I thought of ways to try and fix it without recreating the panel, but at the end of the day, it was just much easier to recreate that panel. So this time what I did was I had the new panel. I, I pre-cut the whole thing. The rabbit you know, was already set up. So I cut all the rabbits on it so it fit in there. And then I used the jig with everything in place. You see to mark it, I did a test cut on the edges just to make sure I fit it back into place so that I can make sure that those lines lined up this time. And then I can continue making this. Now you can see this time around, I already have the rabbit cut and I already went through and put the center cut down. Honestly, I kind of like that order of operations a little bit better. Um, it's not that huge of a deal because this is the sort of a sort of door I'll probably never make again. I make a lot of one offs, but um, if I was making a ton of these, I probably would have done it that way to start with cutting the rabbit and then the center line. It made everything a little bit easier. So once I had that um, remade, 
I can now go through and glue the entire door up. So I'm leaving those panels floating and I'm gluing uh, just, just the mortise and tenons. The plywood will not move around on you, but the frame of the door will. So if you glue the frame of the door to the plywood panels, um, you could have a situation where stuff starts to crack and pull apart. And then I just clamp this. This whole thing fit together really well. Um, I didn't have to do any like major clamping magic or anything like that. So I clamped this up at the end of the day, put three on the bottom, and I don't know if I show in the video, but I put a couple on top after everything's square. So this is just making sure the door is square before finalizing. Honestly, with a barn door, it's not that big of an issue. It's covering the molding, so the only place you might see a gap is from the top of the door to the top of the ceiling or at the floor, but you really would be have to be looking for something like that in order to see a gap. As long as it's, if it's a quarter inch or so off, you probably won't see it if your door's off three quarters square, which you would notice that in the glue up anyway is, is when you'd have an issue. So I could come in the next morning and take the clamps off. Now all the knots, I decided to patch them with some, um, one of my favorite patches is just uh, tight bond. I use tight bond three with some sawdust so I could fill in all those holes. This will also help them from weeping sap over time because um, I've seen furniture that's 20 years old still weep sap. So I just put that on liberally and then sanded it off. I didn't get a ton of painting but I used a shellac based primer that is supposed to help eliminate stains coming through because like I said there there are knots in this and those knot holes will weep even with that that putty on top of them. Um, the one downside to this with the grooves is I had to use a hand brush in order to get the inside of the grooves painted but this shellac uh, primer is expensive but I love it it dries so quickly. So at this point, I think I just have the primer on and I'm just mounting the holes for the hardware. All of this will be in the instructions. I'm not going to get into it too much because it's all going to be a little bit different for each kit. It's pretty simple. They tell you exactly where to drill the holes. It's two, I think, three eighths inch holes. Something I forgot to do, which would have been really easy to do on the table saw, was add the groove on the bottom. So this is actually the morning of the install. I had an uh, oh no moment and I remi re reminded myself I had to cut that groove. So I was, luckily I just clamped a fence onto my router and, and cut the groove on the bottom of the door. Something else I did not film is the cleat for the top. It's just, um, the Lowe's by me sells one by material that is actually an inch thick. And the, the, the molding in the house is an inch thick, so I just painted that in order to get everything on it. So that's just drilled into studs in the wall, and then you could just attach the hardware kit on top of it. And then once that's done, I can just put the door in place. This is pretty much the extent of the install. Um, like I said, I don't like filming in people's homes, but I did want to get it mount. This was actually the first time putting it on the rack and moving it and everything looked, looked really good. I patched those holes in the top of the ledger. Um, I don't film any of that, but I was really happy with how it moved. I also put just regular trim paint on top of this, so it was two coats of primer, two coats of trim paint, and I sprayed the whole thing. And I could kind of set my stops based on where I wanted it to go over the molding. I also add, um, I, I added a handle to this on site to see where the customer wanted it, so you could see the handles in place. Also very easy, it's, it's literally just two holes. And then I had to use two little wooden spacers in order to get that bottom piece where I needed it and then always touch-ups on site you could see there were some touch-ups to be done but this is basically what it looks like now this customer customer was, was um, really interesting in the fact that she specifically wanted this door design because when it was open she almost wanted it to look like a piece of art on the wall which is why she chose that design and I actually thought that was really clever because um, with the big space it takes up it actually looks pretty cool there